you're listening to the Celtic Soul Podcast with me, Andrew Millen, and you're all very welcome to episode 8. My guest today will be Dublin of Paul Bourne, a former Celtic player who played under Liam Brady, Lou McCary and the great Tommy Bournes. This episode has been kindly sponsored by the Karen's Town Lodge, Dulik. Patsy and Simon are looking forward to welcoming all the customers back with all the COVID-19 restrictions in place and social distance for some fine food and drinks when they open early next week. Now, it was nice to hear Damien Duff speak about his time at Celtic. He left the job because of family reasons and he's been given a great opportunity with Stephen Kenny and the Republic of Ireland. And I wish him all the best for the future. And I hope Ireland can qualify for the Euros next summer and give us a couple of good days out in Dublin and a night out in Spain. Gavin Strachan will be his replacement in the dugout at Celtic Park. And a couple of weeks ago when I spoke to John Fallon on the podcast, he told me that he did not think that there was anyone in the Celtic youth system or the underage system that was capable of filling in Damien Duff's boots at this time. And he was proved right. Gavin Strachan comes in with a decent reputation. He was assistant manager at Peterborough with Darren Ferguson, son of Gordon, no stranger to Celtic Park, a former manager. And we would like to wish Gavin the best of luck in his new role. And hopefully he can stay on after we do the 10 in a row. Off the field, Ulster Group, the Green Brigade, were kettled in by police. And not for the first time, I might add, at a recent anti-racism rally in Glasgow. Let's see how this plays out. No doubt the renaming of Glasgow streets unnoticed by the authorities pissed off someone in power. Finally, I would like to wish Lisbon Lion Willie Wallace a very happy 80th birthday. I had the pleasure of joining Willie for a drink at the Las Vegas Celtic Supporters Convention when Jim Riley invited me into the Sydney City CSC marquee at the pool. It was an honour to sit and have a drink with the man. And once again, happy birthday, Willie. You are one of the Celtic legends. You are one of the Lisbon Lions. My guest today, Paul Bourne. I've interviewed Paul a number of times, first for the fans in, and I've done a couple of events where I've interviewed him on stage. We've been to Ireland, Philadelphia and Thailand together, and we always knock out a bit of a laugh together. So here's how I got on with Paul. Uh, today I'm joined by Paul Bourne who first came to prominence in the English Force Division with Oxford, and a certain Ray Houghton was in that team. Uh, obviously, Paul's on the show because of his connections with Celtic, but there's much more to Paul than just Celtic. Hi, Paul. How are you getting back to normality as Ireland gets uh, back to work while still following the social distance rules? Yeah, it is. It's hard enough, and I think it's hard for everybody, uh, Milish. You know, we, we spoke about this when we were in Thailand. We all panicked a little bit, and... I don't think the panic, what we were thinking about in Thailand was as bad when we got back, but it was hard enough, you know, especially for the elderly and, and people not being able to get to work for their, their insanity, basically. Uh, you know, a lot of stuff was taken away from their, their daily lives. They were so much used to, and it's been a fight to the end, and hopefully we're coming to, to the end of it now and we can get back to some sort of normality. Are you back to work, Paul? I am, mate, yeah. I'm back to work now about five weeks, pal. As, in, as you know, I'm connected to CISC, which is a major English company uh, in Ireland. And uh, we're under pressure to do all the, the social homes for the you know the, the people who are homeless and stuff like that. So we're under a bit of pressure now to get them ready. We're, we're sort of seven, eight weeks behind now. So there's a bit of a push on to get them ready, mate. Oh, you've done some gigs with us uh, before the lockdown. Uh, are you enjoying being back on the support of circuit? And is it bringing back a lot of memories? Yeah, it is, and it's a bit. It's a big thank to you, thanks to you and your and your wife, and you introduced myself and Mary, the, the girlfriend, to a, to a couple of gigs up in Drogheda, and, it, and it, it's expired from there. You know, we we, we went to the Philadelphia together. We we've been to uh, Thailand together, which was a good trip, and I thought you'd done really well in the circumstances out there, under a lot of pressure, whether things were going to happen, whether you're not going to happen, and I thought you stood your ground very well, and you ran it very well, and I think a lot of people realised the, the amount of work that you put in and the people you had around you over there. And uh, I think they're looking forward to when this is all over, the 10 in a row Vegas, and then maybe another little trip out to out to Thailand after that. Yeah, please God, please God, Paul. Um, we're already planning it because of the support we got over there. Everyone that was there was looking forward to coming back, even the ones that had to go back early, which is, which is great from them um, because we did put a lot of work into it, but nobody could have planned for a world pandemic. No, you know, and, and to, to the lads that we met out there, the Australian boys, unfortunately, had to cut that trip short and not through fault of their own. It was their government rules and they had to get back in time or 
they were going to get locked out and stuff. And a lot of people, you know, upset a lot of people on the trip because they do a lot of juggling around to organise flights again. And, you know, they, they, they spent a lot of money to get there in the first place and to have it cut short. And but look, they're Celtic fans. You know, they, they know what it's all about. They'll, they, they'll make it happen again. And they'll be probably 10 times stronger the next time. And everybody can have, enjoy themselves in peace without worrying about getting harm about a pandemic. Here, here, Paul. Let's hope. Let's hope we can. Um, Paul, we're coming up now to Celtic are back in pre-season. It seems to get earlier and earlier every year because of the so many games in Europe. I had John Hartson on the podcast a couple of weeks ago, and and John loved his summers off. He loved the point. He loved the Spanish sun. He loved his golf, and he hated coming back because there was so much running involved. Now we did say a lot has changed, but have you memories of those summers and coming back to pre-season? My memories would be the same as actors as John's. We always come back to that little bit overweight and the running was that always a little bit harder for the for the big boys. But um yeah, but look come here, pre-season is what it's all about. You put your foundation in and your fitness, uh, you know, during pre-season, that'll stand it to good stead for you during the season, and you're just topping up all the time. But I think the Celtic players this time around is a little bit different, Millish, because they just done the nine in a row, well deserved, you know, whether they didn't finish finish the season out, they're the best team all year round. They got the nine in a row, but I don't think the boys in mind coming back early as much because they've got so much to look forward to. You know, they've got the Champions League to look forward to. They've also got the the ten in a row, which is going to make history for the football club, for those players involved, and everybody involved in the club is looking forward to this. And uh, I really can't see anybody stopping us except for ourselves, mate. Yeah, and there's also there's also Paul a chance of a treble again because we still are going to play the Scottish Cup semi final and the Scottish Cup final, hopefully. Yeah, it's you know I'd be very disappointed uh, with the team we have and the setup with Lenny and, and and the boys Browner and you know I speak to Simon Donnelly thanks to yourself again getting back involved with the lads and speaking to them and Tomo and and Big John and stuff and there's going to be so much happening this year even from the supporters' point of view from your, for yourself you know going back and forwards the, the, the season tickets and every game is you're going to be on the edge of your seat because you're getting closer to that ten in a row and making history. Uh, I just can't wait to get back but unfortunately you know we can't get back at the moment until it's safe and there has been talk about season books and most people are going to renew them because you don't want to miss out you want to be there at the end of the season but I, you know it, it possibly has been handled badly by the club um, but hopefully something good will come out of it but you know we're going to go back to watching Celtic on TV you know it's it's something I haven't watched any of the German football, I haven't watched the Spanish football, and I haven't watched the English football, but I've been watching Sky Sports News, and they've been telling me that the biggest hype has been at Roy Keane's outpost. So it mustn't be that good of a TV product without the fans. Yeah, well, I watched the Liverpool and Everton game the other night, Millish, to be honest with you, and do you know what? It was like watching Pain Troy. Um, and in, in, it's been now at the end of the season. If I watched another game or I missed a few games, it wouldn't bother me. Um, I just heard Neil Lennon doing an interview there the other day. He was saying, look, you know, at the end of the day, we're, we're professionals. We've got to do the job that's that's put in front of us. And possibly going to play our first OFM derby um, with no fans. It, it's probably looking that way now that's, that's going to happen. And Paul, you've seen both sides of it. You know, you've played, you've played in the big games. You know, you've played in the big leagues, but you've also played in reserve leagues. Is it hard when you've come from playing in front of a full house to go and to play a reserve game? I know you were, when you were younger, you were in the ass reserves. Is it hard to go then? Because that's what it could be like for a lot of the players. I know they're professionals, but to go out and play in front of nobody. Yeah, I just, I just think, well, you know, don't expect a hell of a lot at the start of the season. Don't expect a hell of a lot from the... The Champions League early rounds, if there's not going to be a crowd there, it's very, very hard to motivate yourself. The prizes are still there, the trophies are still there at the end of it all. But you know, the Premiership, it'd be much in the Premiership, and there's no atmosphere whatsoever. And I think the players are feeling that the fitness levels are not, are not up to scratch, the atmosphere is not there, the 12th man is not behind them. I think it's going to be a long stretch for Liverpool to go over the line here with this, you know, with the few games that's remaining because to motivate yourself, and you just say, Millish yourself. People say you're professional, you should be able to deal with it. Most of these players have probably never come across anything like this before, you know, in a reserve match or whatever, because I played in a reserve match against Rangers, there was 21,000 at it, a Roy Brock. But as you say, the, the, the prizes are there at the end of it. The players have got to motivate themselves, get themselves in the right frame of mind, go out there, remember what you're doing, you're representing Celtic Football Club, 
which is one of the biggest honours you'll ever achieve in your life. And when you're there, enjoy every moment of it because when you're not, it's downhill from there, which I've experienced and I'm sure a lot of players after me and before me have experienced too. Yeah, Paul, you mentioned you mentioned the, the reserve game there. And before I get into um, Celtic Rangers and the derby battles that stick out, is there any other derbies that you played in either in Ireland or, or, or in your travels, you know, that were intense and brilliant to play in? Well, you're talking about reserve games, um, Milish. I would have played a lot of Arsenal Spurs, Arsenal Chelsea, uh, coming through the, the sort of the ranks after Oxford. I made me, me, me debut in the old fourth division old Premier Division in England when I was 16. So leading up to games, I would have been a 15 or 16, I would, have, I would have been playing against Chelsea's Mickey Hazard, some people like that. Um, at Chelsea, I would have been playing for Arsenal against Spurs. Uh, you would have Steve Perryman, people like that playing. So as you mentioned, Ray Houghton earlier on at Oxford, John Aldridge, Billy Hamilton, Davy Langan. These are all players that I, that I learned me trade around. And uh, I'm glad I went there. A lot of top clubs came in for me when I was younger. United, Spurs, the Arsenal's, they all came in. But I always felt by going to the smaller club, I had a better chance. And that actually proved to be the best move I've ever made because I probably would have never made it to Celtic if I didn't go to the Oxford at the start and then Arsenal Reserves for a year and play with the players because I was playing at Arsenal Reserves, but I was playing with the Winterbournes. I was playing with Dixons. I was playing with Ray Parler, David Hilliard. I, I played with players like that in, in the Arsenal reserves, you know, against the Chelsea's and the Spurs and stuff like that. So if I didn't play at that level at the time I played, I probably would have never went to Celtic because when I came back to play for Bangor over in, in, in Northern Ireland, it wasn't that it was easy, but I was at the playing with such great players and great levels that it made my transition to go from Bangor to Celtic that little bit easier, if that makes sense, because I played with probably some bigger players that was in the Celtic changing room at the time I was at Celtic. Does that make sense? So the Rocky Road cast was a big, big, big player. Ray Parler, David Hilliard. Uh, Ian Wright came in towards the end of my stint there. Paul Merson, uh, Smitty, Keon, Steve Bold. So when I went to, when I went to Celtic, you had, you had your, your Charlie Nicholas's, your Frank McAvenny's. And it made that transition that little bit easier for, for me to, to adapt of playing with big players, if you like. Paul, what age were you when, when you first broke into the Oxford team? I, I, I went to Oxford at 13. I done my apprenticeship from 13 to 15. And I played in the first team at 16. So I made wow. my debut against Middlesbrough. And I went on to play another four or five games in the bounce after that. A couple of man of the matches, a couple of goals. And uh, Brian Norton was there at the time and stuff, you know. But my best times at Oxford was when I was younger. When they won the Mill Cup, when the Dre Houghton, John Aldridge, Billy Hampton, John Trug, Alan Judge, players that were all there to help me along, Davy Langan. And uh, it was a fantastic Maxwell owned the club. And I've always surrounded myself sort of with small clubs with big names, if that, that makes any sense. And uh, I enjoyed every minute of it. And, I've, you know, people say, would you do anything different? Yeah, of course I would. If I had someone there to control my finances and control me, you know, a little bit off the field to pull the reins in a little bit, God knows what I could have been. But I always felt, and I spoke to you about this a lot, and I speak to the ex-players about it, that I was never Celtic class. But at the time I was there, just the pressure of playing with Celtic, for Celtic Football Club, and then even more pressure, the time that I was there, we were stopping Rangers from doing nine in a row. So every game you were scrutinised. If you made a mistake, you were scrutinised. And, you know, you probably got booed or called names or whatever, people being frustrated because you had to pay into games. But it was like... I grew into myself after uh, Frank Connor looked after me. And uh, then I started to play a few games. My confidence came. And I always felt I did the best I could for the club uh, in such bad times. Because not a lot of people know that when we were there, the club was nearly gone under. And the pressure was just unbelievable on and off the field. Paul, I, I'm, I'm going to just spin back a bit, right? Because I do want to hear about your time at Celtic. But what I'm interested in is, what's it like as a 13-year-old to leave home? To go to, a, yeah. go to a foreign land to, to, to play a trade, like, you know. Well, do you know what, Millish? I'm, I'm in the middle of doing something at the moment here, here in Ireland, and I'm trying, to get it, I'm trying to get it off the ground. I've got to wait to speak to Noel Quinn and a few people about this. We don't do enough in this country to prepare young footballers to go to England. And what I mean by that is, you know, leave, the leaving of their parents, living with strangers. Going to prove your, your, your worth with English coaches who are jealous of Irish people for whatever reasons over the years. And uh, 
you became you, you, you become a little bit robotic and stale. And you know, good players don't make it. Very good players haven't made it and came back to Ireland. So I don't think we do enough to mentally prepare young kids to go to, to go to England. Uh, whether they're going at 14, 15, 16 or 18, we just don't mentally prepare them right. But even more, what I feel more strongly about is because what I went through, the flip coin of it, was when you came home, there was no one there to look after you. You're moving back in with your parents. You were to- you-, you felt you're a failure. You're they're they're turning into drink. They're turning into drugs. They're turning into- they're bringing the they're bringing trouble to their family homes. Uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in the background that we really need to do. Prepare the kids to go away, but also really prepare them of becoming. Because they, in their eyes, they think they are a failure when they come home from England after not making it. And it's not no biggie that if you don't make it a first time around, work hard. We should set up a little, a, you know, a, a camp over here where we have meetings. How how help teach them how to cope with life after you know not making it as a professional footballer. Try and find them a club at home. Uh, get a report from the clubs in England to find out well, where did this kid fail? Where did he go wrong? What can we do to to pull him back on the right road to give him an opportunity to live his life of being a professional footballer. And I don't think enough done is in, in this country. And it's too easy to turn a blind eye and say, ah, sure, he was a bit mad or, you know, he got homesick or he, he took to drink. If I, if I had a pound, like Anthony Stokes and players like that coming home, and if I had a pound for every, for every person that said that about me or anyone else, you know, certain players that came home, Tony Sheridan, all these players that played, Nutsy Fenland that went on to play great careers in the League of Ireland. I'd be a millionaire. And Paul, when you came home, did you feel you had failed? Yeah. I, even though I played in Oxford's first team, I, I came home deflated because after he bought Jimmy Carter, and I've always I've met him after this, you know, George Graham, and he's always said to me, the biggest regret I've had as a footballer was letting you go and buying Jimmy Carter. He bought Jimmy Carter from Liverpool. Jimmy Carter went from uh, Millwall to Liverpool, Liverpool to Arsenal. And Theo Foley, was George Graham's assistant manager. And this is how I ended up at South End after Celtic, because Theo Foley was Ronnie Whelan's assistant manager. So that's what gave me me, me, me chance to come back down south and try and prove myself. I always felt that after Celtic, you know, I was going down to England to prove myself because I failed at Oxford. Does that make sense? I always felt I was trying to prove to myself and others, I can do this. I can make it in, in, in the Premiership. But unfortunately, you know, the knocks along the way with, I was in Jack Charles' Ireland squad, but I wasn't good enough for Mick McCarthy's uh, a trial for Mick McCarthy when he became Ireland manager. Now, whether that was a dislike because of what he heard about me and took a dislike to me and didn't bother calling me up because the ability was there. I was playing in Celtic sports team and I never got I never got that call. I never got that chance. That was a hard pill to swallow for me. It was one of the, the hardest times of my, of my life because I was on the verge of playing in a World Cup under Jack Charles and, and then going from being on the verge and people would say, oh, he was a bit mad off the field, he'd done that. It didn't affect me when I crossed that white line. I gave it my all for my country from the age of 15 up to the senior levels of that was picked under Jack Charlton. And when I put that green in my hoops on at Parkhead or any other ground I represented at the Football Club, I gave me all. I might not have had the best game in the world, but I was giving my all for that football club. And from the day I signed to the day I left, I felt it's only now that I'm, I'm, I'm in my late 40s I'm looking back and how people are telling me like yourself and people showing me videos and the support out there from people that I met in, in, in uh, Philadelphia and, and Thailand has been absolutely wonderful. And it's made me realise, well, OK, maybe I, I didn't do so bad at Celtic. I played eight times against Rangers. I think I was only beaten once and I scored twice. And I just think that looking at as a 48-year-old, looking at that now, I, I've got something to be proud of. Paul, did Bango, like Bango proves that a kid can come home get the head down, walk hard, and then go back because you became a star at Bangor. Yeah, but this is this is what I'm trying to say. We need to get these players, when they come home, we should have, like, with the FAI, what I would like to do is go in and speak to Niall Quinn and say, OK, can I have a list of how many players we have in the English clubs between the ages of 16 and 19 and uh, keep a close eye on them? of when their contracts are up or when they're coming home, that we can organise a training session once or twice a week with them, get them involved with a League of Ireland club on top of that so they're nearly full-time, and speak to them and tell them, look, you're not a failure. Just because it didn't work this time around, it can work next time around. And, and get a report from the club that he's leaving and ask them the reasons why. What is he homesick? Is he shy? Is he not good in a tackle? 
what can we work on to make this kid's dream come alive again after he feels that he's a failure not making a fourth time round? So I think you have to be a very, very strong character. Now I think I think we've got I think we need something like that to mentally prepare the kid prepare the kids for going away to what they're going into. And most importantly, is when they come back and they feel they're a failure. But I think the League of Ireland is a better product than people try to make it out to be because I've seen you play League of Ireland. I've seen Paddy McCall play League of Ireland. I've seen plenty of players that come back from England and then and some of them went down to Scotland then and played and some even went back across the water like yourself. So it is a better league than people make out. Okay, the facilities mightn't be there and, and the backing of the league, especially by certain people in the FEI have never backed it. But I do think, Paul, that it should be an aspiration for kids when they're playing to play League of Ireland. Because, you know, not, not everyone's going to make it. And you played for Bowes. You played in Dublin derbies. You know, that must have been great times, Paul. Brilliant times. But not only that, but the players I played with, Kevin Hunt came over from Barnet. Glenn Crow came back from Wolves. You had myself. You had Billy Boy Malloy. You had other lads coming in from England that Roddy brought in. Uh, you had season... Diehards of Bowers, of Tucky O'Connor and Morris O'Driscoll. You know, you great players. I, I played with great players, the Bowles team, and I was very lucky. Same when I went to Dundalk, I was very lucky at Dundalk and Pats, playing with Eddie Gormley, Paul Ozan, Martin Russell. These are all players that went away, Nutsy Fenlon and all these lads. We have created some fantastic footballers, but never really made it on the English ladder for whatever reason. And we've got to find out those reasons why they were good enough to go away and when in two years all of a sudden they're not good enough and they're back here and who I feel sorry for really is going to be the parents because they move back into the parents' houses they start having a little, smelling themselves a little bit having a little, few drinks and whatever else with their friends and, and they feel they're a failure and I find it very very sad and if you're not a strong character and, and strong in your mind this is when the mental health that everybody is talking about kicks in if you're not mentally strong you're going to suffer and I just think there's a, too many kids out there suffering at the moment because they feel they're a failure when they come home, but they're not. And we've got to be there to tell them and to pick up the crumbs and say, look, you're not a failure. We'll find you a League of Ireland club. You can come and talk to myself or Glenn Crow or Tony Sheridan. Players who have been there suffer from all these things. Same as myself. If I can help a young lad and talk to him for an hour in a room and say, look, this is what you've got to do. You've got to be stronger. And if we can help him, and then one of those kids go back and make it at a level go represent this country or play for Celtic or whatever. But then we've achieved something in this country. We've achieved it. Yeah, you spoke there, Paul, about um, playing eight times in the in the big derby, the big Glasgow derby against Rangers. It's obviously, it's the highlight for a lot of us um, when, when we beat Rangers. You scored the goal and it's been well documented. I've been in rooms which are where people, they just want to talk about that. But there's so much more, as I said earlier on, to Paul Bourne, and there's so much more that I want to get out on the podcast. Tell me what it's like to score against Rangers, because I don't want to hug the whole podcast with that story. Look, it's it's like this. I played, you know, as you said, the managers that I was there under. I was under Liam Brady, he gave me a chance. I, I, I gratitude to them all, uh, even Lou McCarry, um, believe it or not, because Lou kept me at the club that little longer. He doubled me contract. Uh, Frank Connor, who had me in the reserves for six months, I lived with Liam Brady, under that time, I was living with Liam Brady. I was playing with a Frank Connor in the reserves. Myself, Stuart Gray, Simon Donnelly, Brian McLaughlin. We were all playing in that in that reserve side together. Which we went with Charlie Nichols and Frank Mack and a few others that dropped down on the first team who made the youth with the you know the experienced players. We won. We won. I think out of the three seasons I was there, we won two doubles in the reserves, the league and the cup. Stuart Kerr and goal, uh, Marshall and goal. We some great players, but. I had a bit of gratitude of with Frank Connor, uh, Liam Brady, Lou McCarry, and then Tommy Burns to play me against, you know, Rangers in the time to, in both games that I scored. And um, I owe every one of them uh, that little bit of gratitude. But a young boy to come from Ireland to play against Rangers is just a dream for everybody. But to score twice against them is even a bigger dream. It's just something that I will never forget, and I don't think anybody else will as long as you're connected to Celtic Football Club. Now, Paul, you came home. You thought you were a failure. You went to Bangor. You became a bit of a hero up there. And then an Irish legend. And I know Liam's time at Celtic wasn't, wasn't the greatest of any manager. 
by any stretch of the imagination. But Liam, when we were growing up, Liam Brady was this iconic player that played with Arsenal, had played in Italy, and now he was Celtic manager. How did it feel when Liam Brady comes knocking on the door and asks you to come and join Celtic? It was a great time for me, not only you know to become the to be asked to sign for Celtic Football Club, but for such a great player. And a lot of people say not a great manager, but for such a great player and what he achieved in his career, to notice that I had the ability to play for Celtic's first team in the first place was a great honour and a great achievement. And it's something that I'll always own. And I think in the back of his mind, if you spoke to Liam Brady, I don't think I let him down in any way, shape or form. Um, in the short time that I was at Celtic and the amount of games that I played, and especially going on to score those goal against goals against Rangers. He might tell you different. <laughs> You've shared a few stories um, when we do the live shows, Paul, and I, I obviously don't want to give everything away, um, but you did live with him for six months. Yeah, I did. And I used to be drooling at the dinner table because his nickname was Chippy. He always had chips and he was putting me on salads and I used to dream of flying steaks before I went to sleep. And <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. It, it, could have been, it could have been nightmares, but they were dreams. But... Um, the best one ever was, I've spoken about this and anyone knows me, um, you know, after I left Bangor and I went to Celtic and we were in Italy and we are coming towards the end of the pre-season tour and I was sitting on the bus and I was still living with Liam at the time and I sat up the front of the bus and I was drinking a can of Fanta and uh, all the lads were down the back of the bus and he said he didn't have a couple of beers so he says, Burnsy, I'd rather you not drink the Fanta and go down and have a couple of cans with the lads and I, yeah, no problem. One can went and two cans went. I had about four or five cans. Peter Grant, of course. He says, hey, Bunsy. He says, um, have you ever been to Italy before? When I, you know, the little cockney sort of real dub, you know, was great. He says, do you mean have you ever been to Italy before? I said, of course I have. He said to me, what part? I said, Madrid. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard and that before, Paul, and I still yeah. laugh at it. That's that's what broke the ice, pal, with me with the Celtic lads, and 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 I've had great friends ever since. Like, although you know it wasn't the most successful period in, in Celtic's history, there were some great no. players in that team, Paul. Paul McStay, John Collins, as you said, Peter yeah. Grant. Yeah, you you Peter the Pointer, you Paul uh, the Maestro, you you know you Frank McAvenny, you Charlie Nicholas, you Tony Mowbray, you Tom Boyd, you Tosh McKinley. You Simon Donnelly. Players all went on to win doubles and trebles with Celtic Football Club. And uh, it was just, the, the, you know, we have a laugh about this all the time. And funny enough, I can't tell any more jokes about Andy Painting now because he's befriended me on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> I, have to, I have to leave him out of me. Uh, Keep that for the live show. Yeah, I have to leave that out of me, uh, of me, of me show now. And were you good when Liam left? I'll tell you how it happened. I made me debut against St. Johnston away and uh, coming back on the bus Liam told me that he was going in the next day to resign and that he was very sorry but he thought I had a bright future at Celtic Football Club with Aberdeen. Downton and I never forget him saying to me the least you can get out of football would be a house and a car and he was right he was right he was spot on and everything he told me that he'd do for me when I was there he did and as I said, a, a, such a player of his, you know, over the years, what he became, how good he was, not only as a, a, a beautiful footballer, but a beautiful person. And maybe the time came a little bit too soon for him to manage such a big club, I don't know. But uh, I think he knew that he took them as far as he could. And, you know, with the takeover, um, the club were going to go to bigger places. And uh, that's exactly what happened. And he resigned. And... When Lou McCarry came in, a lot of players I've interviewed, there wasn't have much time for Lou, but you you were happy that he extended your contract. Is that correct? Yeah, well I was delighted, like anybody else would. Um, but I just think that was think that was sort of a panic thing because I was uh, Jack Charlton had me in the uh, part of the World Cup squad and I was doing a lot of trips with the Ireland squad and I think Celtic thought I was gonna get a full international cap. And uh, maybe go on to be a million pound player, if, even if I didn't fulfil me in full potential at Celtic, that they'd probably sell me for a few quid. I don't know. They'd have to ask Lou McCarry that. But I was just chuffed that he uh, seen how well 
well, I thought I was doing, and, and maybe a few a few fans, majority of the fans thought I was doing. I never said I was a wool beater or a superstar, but as I said, when I was there, I gave my all, and I think I was probably rewarded with you know the contract that Liam McCarry gave me. But I think that was a, a reward for me getting into the international squad and becoming an international. Now you were also there when the old board were on the way out, and the rebels were on the way in with the fans and Fergus McCann. How aware in the dressing room what were the players of the takeover? Well, at, at that particular time, I, I, I never really, and this probably sounds a little bit selfish, never took any, any really notice. It was, I know it was hard not to take notice, you know, you know fans with banners and probably about 10,000 people at 12, such empty stadiums and people had you know, been deflated and, 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 and sort of given up, if you like. But when Fergus McCann came in, he promised Celtic fans a new stadium. Um, he he's promised Celtic that he was going to stabilise the club in a way that they're going to move forward in the future. And that's exactly what the man done. And uh, hats off to him. And Celtic Football Club have gone on strength to strength and haven't looked back since. But the hardest part of all of that was us playing at Hamden. You know, I remember nights getting beaten 3-1, 4-1, Park Thistle. You know, when I was growing up, I thought Park of Thistle nil was the name because he never scored a bleeding goal. <laughs> <laughs> and then all of a sudden I'm playing against them at, at Hamden the National Stadium and we're getting beaten 3-4-1 and four, one on a Wednesday night in the Pistons Arena so yeah it, it was very 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 hard times and very deflating times and, and as I said to you Millish if, if I was playing Simon Donnelly went on to play with the likes of Larson and John Hartson and stuff like that I think anybody could have played with the likes of those players you know if you had anything about you you could play with those players and uh, when you're playing against the party thistles and all that and the club was doing so bad as I said earlier on in the conversation you're scrutinised you make one mistake and it's baboon you and oh, he's a monkey he's a dud he's, you know all those names that, that, that they would call you but if you're in a team that's win, won the league and you're in the final at the, at the Scottish Cup and you make two or three mistakes you're not scrutinised as much because you're winning trophies and you're winning games and the, the hardest thing was to play for Celtic Football Club was trying to stop Rangers doing nine in a row and you're coming up against the likes of Gary Stevens, Trevor Stevens, Ali McCoy, Durant, Mark Haley, uh, Brian Laudrup, Basil Bowley, Richard Goff. You know, and we just weren't strong enough at that particular time and I think the club was in such a, a bad state at the time that the team felt it and the results showed. Obviously, Fergus steadied the ship, Paul, and he brought in Tommy Bones. Obviously, Tommy is an iconic figure of Celtic. Did his presence make a big difference in the dressing room? I just think what happened was, it was also his presence. You know, as you said, he's, a, he's an iconic and he's never be forgotten and he's, he's, earned, he's, he's earned that title. I just think everything changed. The training changed. He was bringing players, you know, Gavin Hoidonks in and the training was getting better and he brought different things to the club, you know, the, the food. You know, different rules. Everything changed at the club at that particular time. He was bringing in, you know, I could see Tommy wanted to bring in these players that were going to win doubles and trebles and put Celtic back on the map. And he started off with the likes of Pierre and Hoidonk. And it proved then, you know, all the other players that come in after Pierre when, when I left. And I think I think Simon Donnelly left at one stage and went down to Sheffield Wednesday and Brian McLaughlin started fading away and Stuart Gray, all the players that I'd started my career with at Celtic were sort of, you know, moving on because he was bringing in Tommy meant business and he was bringing in players to win trophies for Celtic Football Club. And that's exactly what he did. And at the end of that season, we won the Scottish Cup. And I knew after playing in nearly every round but the final, that was my last game for, for Celtic Football Club. I know you didn't play in the pod and it must, it must be hard. But it was a great relief for us, the fans, especially after the League Cup defeat. Yeah, you know that was the first one on the road to many, and I think it was a, it was such a relief that when Celtic won that particular. Time. But don't forget, a few a few months before that, we lost in the in the, the League Cup final on penalties to Ray Rovers. So it was like sort of one disappointment after another. You know, lost against Ray Rovers, or he was starting to fizz out of the first team. I was dropped for the. The cup final. So I was, as I said to you, you have to be a strong character to, to be able to deal with these things during your career. Mick McCarty didn't look at me for the Orleans squad after being in Jack's teams. 
I'd never met Mick McCarthy before, and I just felt that he felt like he just took a dislike to me through whatever reason, whether he heard stories from people at Celtic Football Club or players he played with that, or that were at the club or whatever it was, he just didn't give me a chance. And I just felt then that, like, I'll move down south and I'll, I'll see how I go on down south. I'll start all over again. And and I did that. And I played with South End for three years, which I, I really enjoyed as well under Ronnie Whelan. And, you know, and then I came home again and I played League of Ireland. I was su- very successful in League of Ireland again, you know, winning trophies. Um, I know it's not at the, the same level as Celtic Football Club or anywhere else, but I was still happy. I was still a, a bubbly character. I still enjoyed my football. I was winning trophies. And all I really wanted to do all my life since, since I was a kid was play football. And I did that till I was 33. And one of the biggest honours was playing for Celtic Football Club. I go back to Scotland and people just never forget you. You go on these trips with yourself. It's just amazing. You have to pinch yourself sometimes that, I did, do you really want to speak to you? You know, and it's, it's brilliant. They're just, it's a magnificent what you do and what other Celtic supporters clubs do around the world and, and, and in Ireland is just incredible because it's an incredible club and incredible people. Yeah, and and just back to that '95 Cup final, uh, what a relief it was! You know, it was just so great to see Paul McStay lifting the trophy because he was so loyal to the club. Yeah, look, come here. He was a great help to me. Unbelievable. He always kept me going. My head dropped a little bit. He was the one that would keep you going. He really had high belief and hopes for me for me personally. If you ever speak to him, he always spoke to me and, you know, to, it could be anything I want to be. And But just maybe, you know, maybe with Tommy saying he couldn't guarantee me first team football as to me duty out of Pram a little bit too quickly. Maybe I should have, like, two years left in my contract. Maybe I should have maybe give it maybe another season and tried to break in under the players that he was bringing in. And maybe I would have got that chance to play with those better players. No disrespect to the players that I was playing with at Celtic at the time, but I think it was a mixed match. You know, I think Lou brought a few players in that were in Celtic class. I just think that the likes of uh, Charlie was finishing up and Frank was finishing up with a bit of youth coming through, as I say, Brian McLaughlin and stuff like that, which a lot of people thought, well, if Celtic are going to go to the next level, you know, these boys can't be in the first team. No, we've really got to go there and boy the Cadetis and the Canios and all these people that actually came to the club after us. But a lot of people have got to remember this, is that we kept the club afloat. No matter how bad or how good they thought we were at the time in the Celtic jersey, we were there. We went through those times that they were going through. And believe you and me, it was probably tougher for a player than it was for a fan. And as, as you said, um, you know, you left Celtic, you went down, you teamed up with an Irish legend and Ronnie Whelan. Then you came back to the League of Ireland. You had a stint in Philadelphia. Yeah. And and then then your career finishes, Paul. How hard is it when no one's chanting your name anymore? Yeah, it, it's, it's very hard. And, and it goes back to being that... I've always thought of being a mentally strong person. And I think I am. And I think I still am today. And I think anybody that knows me knows I'm mentally strong. Because if I wasn't mentally strong and what I went through in my life, off and on the field, I'd probably be in the Liffey, the River Liffey. You know, mental health and stuff like that. You have to be strong. You turn to drink. You turn to things that you're not, you do things that you're not proud of. And I'm 48 years of age now, and it's just like it's done a full somersault. And I'm happy again. I'm bubbly again. I speak to the players. You get me involved in, in, in the Celtic trips and to speak to people. And, and it, it's great because I went through a period of my career, towards the end of my career, that, as you say, no one chants your name anymore. You're looking over your shoulder. Your friends have gone. The money is dried up. And uh, you look around and you really know who your friends are when all that happens. And I'm just delighted to be to, to be back involved with the lads. We've got a few things coming up now together in the next in the next couple of months and all this dies down with New York. We have a game for the homeless here in Dublin, which I've organised. So I have got a heart uh, underneath it all to, to, to run these games for the for the homeless. And uh, I'll be speaking to the lads in the next in the next few weeks and few months, uh, seeing what the schedules are going to be to see if we can continue that. Game for the homeless down to Cork, maybe Galway and up to Belfast, and uh, raise a few bob for people who really need it. Paul, the game in Dublin, which was scheduled for was it May? It was scheduled for the nineteenth of April. Yeah, when uh, when can we expect that to happen? Well, you're gonna look at that. We're looking at that now at the start of September, end of August, uh, start of September. I've just got to speak to the players to see will they be available because what we don't want to happen really is just the players to come over here, give their all, and then go back and have to quarantine for two weeks, which which with, with their own families and kids and stuff like that. So we've got to look at that side of things. And then the other side of things is, of course, what everybody likes to do is have a bit of dinner and have a few points after it. 
So we're waiting for the pubs and hotels to open back up. And uh, as soon as that happens, which I really believe will happen towards the end of July, mid end of July, and hopefully things will settle down in August and we can really push it to get it going again in uh, start of September, end of August, start of September. Well, we look forward to it, Paul. Paul, yeah. as always, it's been a pleasure chatting. Um, I, I did want to delve in a bit to your life out away from Celtic. I wanted to get into the mind of that young player that went to England that had to come home, that got his chance at Celtic, and then how his career played out and when, when the lights fade. And thanks very much for being so honest with me because we hope the podcast is, is addressing uh, a few things that maybe other podcasts are not. So listen, thank you yeah. so much, Paul, and hopefully we'll have you on again and hopefully we'll have a few points at this homeless game. It's, it's, it's always a pleasure speaking to you and thanks very much for what you've done for me. Um, you and your missus have been great and uh, I love taking Mary to the, to the things that you organise. They're always run very well and uh, I hope to speak to you soon and uh, even better to go and see you and have a few points. Great stuff, Paul. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you very much. No problem, mate. God bless you. I'd like to thank Paul there once again for taking time out to chat to me. I think you'll agree he's got a really good story to tell. Thanks to everyone who has visited our website, CelticFansIn.com, and bought the fans in, a t-shirt or a polo top or whatever you've bought. Your support means we can continue to create free content, written, spoken, and when the venues are back open, we can kick off with our free live events again, once it's safe to do so. The podcast is available on all platforms, Apple, Acast, Spotify, etc. So please subscribe and follow us so you never miss an episode of the Celtic Soul podcast. And also please follow us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Thanks again to our sponsor, the Karenstown Lodge, and to our producer, Ron McQuillan. And to you, the listeners, keep the feedback coming in. Let us know your story and who you would like us to get onto the podcast. Keep the faith and more importantly, stay safe so we can all get back to the football as soon as possible.